Hi, everyone, and welcome to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Vantage Point. I'm Alyssa Corum, Multimedia Content Editor here at IBD, and my co-host today is Justin Nielsen, IBD's Market Research Director. And then we have Arusha Pires, which our loyal podcast listeners are very familiar with, Portfolio Manager at O'Neill Global Advisors. And we have Scott St. Clair, our special guest for the week. He is Senior Product Coach at Marketsmith. So welcome, guys. A little Thank bit you. of a roundtable today, huh? Yeah, good to be here. Exactly. And the reason why we have this roundtable, of course, is this is my first time hosting the podcast. Uh, your prior host, Arusha Pires, he's leaving us, uh, but he all, he likes to say that we're we're leaving him. Yeah, I, I think that is the more proper thing. Everyone's leaving me, but I'm <laughs> the only one staying. And uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm the only one staying, but unfortunately, I couldn't go just because of some other opportunities that I could not turn down. So I am no longer part of the IBD family, which uh, breaks my heart in, in many ways, but uh, you're but you'll hands. always be a part of yeah. the family, and right? I will still, like, I will still be part. Yeah. Well, and, like and Webster, so for people that know? don't know what we're talking about here, there's right. maybe some news that uh, we need to share because uh, after the podcast dropped last week, um, uh, on the same day, some news came out uh, that uh, News Corp was going to be buying Investors Business Daily. Uh, we're going to be under the Dow Jones arm under that branch. And uh, this is actually something that we're looking at as a very exciting opportunity. Uh, there's um, so again, Arush is going to be staying with with IBD's current parent company, uh, and again, he's a portfolio manager, and uh, that's that's a great spot for him to be in because of all his market knowledge. Uh, and you know, who who would blame him for not not wanting to turn down that opportunity? Um, but yeah, the rest of us are going to be uh, moving over to Dow Jones, and that's a, a deal that's going to be uh, closing, you know, sometime in the next few months. Um, but yeah, do you want to talk a little bit more about what that means, uh, Allie? Yeah, uh, this is a very exciting opportunity, a great next chapter for our company that we're all very, very excited about in terms of what it means for our growth and fueling research and development. Uh, Scott and Arusha, I'm sure you both are very familiar with wanting to improve our products, Marketsmith. Uh, we're going to be able to do that and, and focus on this uh, in this next chapter. And I know our, our new parent company, they told us that they had admired IBD from afar. And in this acquisition process, were able to admire us up close and want IBD to be even more IBD moving forward. So that's definitely something that I am very pumped about. I don't know about you guys. No, absolutely. I think the, the big thing here is that they're not trying to absorb us into into their company, they're really allowing us to, you know, maintain ourselves as our own company and, you know, let IBD be IBD. That was something we had a company meeting with the new CEO. And, um, you know, that was the big, the big takeaway I got from that company meeting was that they want IBD to continue to be IBD. And of course that means uh, fulfilling Bill O'Neill, our founders initial idea of getting information to the investor. Uh, you know, this is something where he always believed the stock market was a way for anyone, anyone willing to put in the work to be very successful, um, to, you know, achieve financial independence, security, all of those things. Um, and, and, you know, frankly, a lot of financial freedom uh, that, that comes with the gains you can get in the stock market. Again, um, there's a lot to learn there. Uh, there it's, it's not easy as uh, I think we can all attest, uh, you know, with, with our experience, it's not something that you're every day saying, wow, I, you know, I nailed it every single day. You know, you, you will have your challenges. And uh, part of what we've always tried to do at Investors Business Daily is help people get through those challenges and uh, learn from the mistakes, move on from them and uh, find those opportunities as they arise. That's yeah, and right. I, I just want to say one quick thing. Both Scott and I were former customers of IBD. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so Bill O'Neill inspired both of us to really learn the stock market. And we loved it so much we came to work for the company. I, and I clearly remember the first time I went to the seminar, Bill O'Neill was up there on the charts and he'd be like, hey, Justin, 
put 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 this i think it was uh, i can't even remember what the the projector thing was now but it was like the laminate kind of projector. oh, oh the El- like i think it was the elmo or something yeah <laughs> one <All right>. of <laughs> those things but it, those yeah so I, I remember justin from way back when so absolutely this is uh going to help ibd go to the next level and and more and more people are going to be able to learn this uh quicker and easier and to be clear, even though Arusha can no longer be the host of the podcast, we're still going to have him as a recurring guest. So this isn't a goodbye. <laughs> You're still going to see and hear more from Arusha, whether you like it or not, I guess. Uh, no, <laughs> we are really going to miss you. And you're going to be on IBD Live. You're going to be around. So that is really great. So don't don't fear, audience. You're still going to get Arusha. Sync made, made a, a song <laughs> called uh, Bye Bye Bye. <laughs> Bruce's Rush, new theme song. Well, the, 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 the eagerness Scott St. Clair is showing is just yeah. Uh, yeah. Scott doesn't remember, doesn't realize I'm still his boss. So yeah. he, he's for already. <laughs> time, time it sounds like uh, Scott's done some measuring yes. of the curtains. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys are funny, but yeah, uh, and we really do appreciate all of the work, Arusha, that you've put in uh, to this podcast in particular. And so we definitely want to celebrate your tenure as host. You did an amazing job, so many amazing guests, a lot of great educational material, and we do highly encourage the audience to check out our archive. There's so many great episodes. I mean, every time you really drill down to get educational nuggets of knowledge that can benefit traders for the long run. So thank you for all your great work. No, it, it, it was an honor, absolutely, and, and I, I wish I could have continued it, but that being said, it's being passed on to both Allie and Justin, and so it's in great hands, and I know this podcast is really going to go to the next level uh, with all the new resources and, and distribution that Dow Jones is going to provide. Well, you have really big shoes to fill, and Justin and I are, are going to do our best, but let's get on to talk about the current market because... There was some pretty interesting action out there today, guys. What do you think of the NASDAQ's strong gain closing up one and a half percent today and chip stocks, it seems like, really took the spotlight. Scott, we'll start with you. Yeah, it was a good day in the NASDAQ. Uh, I was asking Justin earlier, was it a fall today? I don't think the volume, according to Rusha, uh, was, it was, was not there. Lower. Yeah. yeah. But it didn't have to be a, a follow today because IBD already has it, you know, in confirmed uptrend. But there was some strong action in the chip sector, which we'll probably talk about a little later. But it was nice um, to have something to buy, which is the key. If the market's strong, you want to have good merchandise. I wouldn't say there's a ton of merchandise, but it's it's starting to, uh, you know, filter in slowly. And I have the SMH Vanek vector semiconductor ETF pulled up here just to underscore how chips were leading today. That ETF up almost 3% for the day. Uh, But Justin Ascott was saying underneath the surface, a lot of really interesting action in this group. Yeah, it it felt a little bit more normal, I guess, you know, when you have the NASDAQ leading, the S&P 500 still doing fine. Um, You know, the Russell, the Russell 2000 was participating, as opposed to this, you know, bifurcated market that we've had so much of lately. And I mean, you know, the Dow Jones industrial average was down today, but uh, that's, you know, a lot of times we're, uh, you know, looking at the Dow in a very different way because it's only 30 stocks. So it, it just felt a little bit more normal. Now, that doesn't mean we're out of the woods, though. Um, we've been in a very uh, rotation type market. Uh, you know, there, there have been these cyclical plays, these real economy plays, the reopening plays that have all been kind of on our forefront uh, in, in our minds lately. But now we have to look and see, OK, is is there a true movement that can stick? So a couple things that I'm looking at for the NASDAQ composite in particular, um, you know, we did get back above the 21 day moving average line, which is good. I want to see that low being able to cross above that 21 day moving average line and hold there. So that's kind of my next step. I'd like to see the NASDAQ get above the 50 day moving average line. You know, that's that's another thing that would be kind of nice to see here. And, um, you know, so it's it's. I want to make sure that people understand this isn't just your, um, you know, floodgates opening where you just say, okay, you know what, everything is back on. It's like it's, you know, a year ago, you know, in 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 April where the market just rip roared, uh, you know, forward. 
um, it could still have some choppiness here. So it's it's worth being careful, um, you know, recognizing where the setups are and, you know, playing a little bit, letting the market give you that feedback of, okay, if it's working, then you can put some more in. If it's not working, then you back away. That's just that simple. Now, Arusha, how big of a step in the right direction do you think today's action was? Does it really give you encouragement or are you still pretty hesitant to uh, play the chip space and tech in general? I'm a little bit more encouraged. I think the last couple of days, just underneath the surface, there, there were some nice upside reversals and, and a little bit of uh, more progress today. And so that more stocks now have a chance to build the right hand side of the bases. So that is encouraging. Uh, we, I would definitely, I, I would, I would feel a lot better if we had a fall through date on the NASDAQ, if this qualified and maybe it, there's still a chance. I mean, the volume is still coming in and, and so potentially it could be higher. It's not a very high bar to go over. Uh, so I, I think this is the best I've felt about the NASDAQ in weeks. And so We'll have to wait and see. I think you'll still have some time. Now, some of those semiconductors, uh, SMH was managed. I actually bought some SMH today just to get some exposure. Mm-hmm. I have so, uh, I have a small positions in some other semiconductors too, but uh, the SMH, I, was, I took a little bit larger position there uh, just to, because some of those semiconductors are a little extended right now, but I want to get some more exposure in some of the traditional kind of growth areas just for now. And then I can move that money out and put it in stocks when they're truly acting like uh, they want to go up again. And I, it's, I think worth mentioning that some of these semiconductors were, you know, kind of foreshadowing, I, I should say, yeah. you know, that they, they, they were looking strong. They had the setups, they were actually going through some breakouts and things like that. So, um, you know, yeah, AMAT is a great example. Applied Materials, uh, ticker symbol AMAT. Uh, you know, and I this, do have some shares of this. This is yeah, the- that that we put this on Swing Trader, uh, you know, a, a few days ago, and so this is something where it's it's already showing the strength. You know, this looks very different from the Nasdaq. You know, the Nasdaq is struggling to get back above its 21 day and 50 day moving average line, whereas AMAT is, you know, it's already there. It's a new high ground. It's, it's, it's looking much better. And it's not alone. That's the other part is, you know, it'd be one thing if it was just one of these stocks, you know, uh, as a lone wolf, but you had a number of stocks in the group that were looking very similar, looking very strong. I think AMAT definitely sticks out, but you, you, you had a number of them to choose from, which whenever you have more choices in setups and things like that, that's one of the things that also, I think, makes you feel a little bit better about the market. Mm -hmm. So today's action was very encouraging, but it's been a little tricky. So when we come back, Justin, Scott, and myself, we're going to be talking about sell rules because there have been a number of setups over the last couple of weeks, but it hasn't been easy to handle them. So that's where those sell rules come into play. So we'll discuss that when we come back. Hi, everyone. It's Allie and Justin here. So after we wrap the podcast episode We wanted to insert this right here, right after the first segment, because we looked, Justin, and it did turn out that we did get the volume that we needed on the NASDAQ for it to be a follow through day. Yeah, there was this whole uh, email chain going back and forth among the markets team that I was concentrating on the podcast, of course, not looking at my emails. And then as soon as we finished taping, I saw wow, the volume did come in. And this was kind of one of the things I was surprised at because a lot of times, especially at the end of the quarter, you usually do get you know heavier volume. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, it, it was a little bit of a surprise and it usually does come in at the end um, and it looks like that's what happened. So uh, the notes that I have look like it came in 250 million shares higher on the NASDAQ composite than on Tuesday. And so that does technically give us a follow through day on the NASDAQ composite that we have been looking for. Um, That does kind of change a little bit in terms of our feeling of, hey, you know, this, this could be something that is got some legs to it. Now, we still have a lot of those warnings where, look, we don't want to plunge in, we don't want to just put everything in at once, you want that market to give you the feedback of your decisions being right, and uh, continuing on. So, uh, it, it's important to note uh, that, hey, this is a follow through day. Bill always wanted to make sure that he was taking action on those days. Um, and if you you know, see it follow up from here, all of the stuff we were talking about, taking over that 21 day moving average line and staying above it like it has. Exactly. Getting above that 50 day moving average line. You know, but this is just one more thing that kind of gives you a little bit more of a start that uh, things might be turning for the NASDAQ composite. 
that it does. So we wanted to share this piece of information so our viewers can hear it when we drop the podcast episode. Want to dominate the stock market this year? With the latest stimulus now in your pocket, you may be guessing which trades are the best to invest in. But with Vantage Point, you don't have to. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and find out how Vantage Point's AI technology can forecast stock market trends up to three days in advance with incredible accuracy. Vantage Point's patented technology analyzes huge quantities of global data in seconds. Stop guessing. Check out www.freestockcoaching.com and experience Vantage Point for free. Trading involves financial risk and is not suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Welcome back to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Vantage Point. I'm here with Justin Nielsen and Scott St. Clair. Now, Scott, buying, it seems like, is a little bit easier than selling. Selling seems to be pretty tricky for newer people and even uh, many of us out there with a bit more experience. So th there's a lot of layers and techniques that you can get into, but talk to us about that uh, tricky element that comes with the selling. Yeah, I'm 25 years in and still don't have it down pat. <laughs> selling is very difficult, especially if you get ahead. Now, the, the rules for cutting losses are, are pretty concrete. They're crystal mm -hmm. clear. It's not easy to cut a loss, but it's real. The, the numbers are real easy. The hard part where I think a lot of the feedback that I get from people is I'm up 83% in XYZ. Uh, what do I do? I was up 83% in XYZ and now I'm up 42%. What do I do? Right. And that's the, the, really the, the, the trickiest, hardest part. So, um, you know, Bill wrote a book, I think it's what, uh, you know, 20 chapters long and two of the chapters are on selling because, you know, selling is, is a big part of it. Um, a lot of people, uh, don't realize how, how tricky it is. It's not just the opposite of, of buying something. So yeah, it, especially the, the profit taking. I think that's where people really want to develop a set of rules or a process to, you know, taking profits. Arusha talked about the webinars and I think it's such a transit, a great trans transition. I don't think he knew, but uh, I have a friend who went to a ton of webinars. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep saying you mean webinars. seminars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank I'm, you, I'm like, if it's 1992, it wasn't yeah, a webinar. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the modern <laughs> age now. But in the old days, we would go. You'd fly yeah. to Atlanta to see uh, Bill speak, etc. And so he had taped a bunch of them, and I listened to him. It's fun to listen to um, Bill talk. And you know, 1992 in November, he talked about you know how he liked to take profits. You know, he said if I had four stocks that I had a 25 to 30% gain on, I think I'd take a couple of them. The two that I would keep would be the ones that I had that I think are the strongest stocks, the real leaders, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's a great process. You know, in other words, half the stocks he's going to take 20, 25, 30% if you're lucky enough to get it that much. But every once in a while, I think you want to go for a home run, so to speak. You want to keep it. Uh, it doesn't mean you're going to get it right every time, but if you get a PayPal, a Square, a Google, an Amazon, I could go on and on. You get one of those every 18, 24 months. It doesn't even have to be that often. No, it doesn't. <laughs> they, they can, I mean, they can really move the needle on, mm -hmm. on your, your portfolio. So I, I think that's, that's what I try to do. It's easier said than done, but um, I think that's, that's the process. I think you want to take some profits in some names because if you don't and the market goes over, over a cliff, uh, a la, you know, the, the COVID crisis, you know, you've got, if you bought 10 stocks before the COVID crisis and you had three losers and seven winners, and then the market, I don't care how good your stocks are when the market rolls over that bad, they all roll over. And you, you could, you'll turn all those winners into losers. And so you were in a cycle where you, you could have put some points on the board, so to speak, in your portfolio, and you had nothing but losses. And that is very discouraging. A lot of people would give up. Whereas if you, you know, you took the, the, the loss on three of the bad names, no problem. You took profits on four of them. Great. That would more than offset the three you got wrong on. And maybe you try to go for a home run for two of them and it didn't work. No problem. You got out even, but
but you made a little progress in that cycle. And then you're ready. Your mental capital is strong for the next cycle, which came back awfully fast, a lot faster than any of us would have expected. And, you know, it's, it's a very good point here. And people should understand that this is, this is sometimes where that perseverance has to come in because, um, you know, this is something that has probably happened to everyone, you know, that's, that's, that's gone through this process of trying to become a better investor. And it happened to Bill O'Neill. Uh, he writes in his book, How to Make Money in Stocks, about the summer of 1961, uh, where he had nailed a bunch of great stocks. He had good gains. Uh, he really felt like he was making progress. And then he basically round tripped a lot of them, you know, round tripping, of course, meaning that he was selling them right where he bought them uh, after having good gains. And so uh, one of the great things about Bill was that he was always this, you know, trying to tinker with things and trying to fix it and trying to learn from his mistakes and, you know, doing that post analysis. And because of that summer of 1961, that's where he, you know, he did two things. He discovered that, hey, I don't have any sell rules, number one. And number two, the market turned and I wasn't aware and I, I wasn't on top of it. So he really kind of buckled down and came up with some market rules to kind of give him some extra signals there. Um, but it's, it's, it's an absolutely good point. It's a, it's a hard thing sometimes, especially if you get this feeling like this could be the life changer. This could be the, the, the one that is, you know, allows me to retire and, you know, you know, sit on beaches, uh, drinking mimosas. It's, you, you, you kind of get into that mentality. There's a psychological component where you feel like it's never going to end. And it just always does. <laughs> at some yeah. Point. It's funny you say that. Cause it, you know, if you've been around a long time and you've bought good stocks, it's happened to you. I, I can tell you about the $4 million profit I'm missing because I sold <laughs> Apple. <laughs> yeah. I bought Apple in 2004 in the very first cup with handle. And, you know, who knows where I sold it. But, you know, th that's one in 250 or 500 stocks. There's plenty of other stocks in 04. I don't remember that I took gains on and or took losses on that never came back. So, um, it's, it's hard because I, I wish they would delist stocks once you sell them, because then, <laughs> then you don't have to go and look, right. and that's the problem. They stick around for a long time and, and make you feel silly. You know, Amazon, Google, you know, Facebook, Apple, I could go on and on all the stocks that I've sold too soon, but there's and also especially in retrospect when you're like, well, of course I should have known. <laughs> it always seems so easy. Right. And, and when I, and I, I'll tell you, when I bought Apple in 2004, you can look at the chart. It didn't do a whole lot. And I actually thought this is a laggard. It's not doing anything. It's not going up. Um, when I go back and look and remember that thought process, well, the market was lousy. So <laughs> Apple actually was, was acting great. It was going sideways while the market was coming down and, I don't know. I don't know why I didn't put two and two together, but I, I had just come out of the nineties and was used to everything being, you know, if it wasn't a rocket ship, it was a laggard, you know, and this mm -hmm. was 2004, the market had come through a, a, a tough period. So, you know, it was, it, it was just different environment and I, I, I wasn't prepared, but that's like you mentioned with Bill, that's the process, you know, learn the mistake you made and then try to make a rule to, to help you so you don't uh, make that same mistake again. And 20 years later, you're hopefully like, oh, I remember, I remember that. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to play it differently if I see something like that again. Yeah, I, I don't look, I, you know, admittedly, I never would have held Apple through the great financial crisis. You know, I think, I think I. Bill didn't I, either, you know. <laughs> yeah, nobody, well, not nobody, but yeah, it, it, it'd be impossible because I, the, the other hard part that when stocks go up is they become a larger percentage of your portfolio. Absolutely. And, you know, let's say you put 25,000 in Apple and, and now it's worth a hundred. And then it goes through just a normal correction, a 25% correction. Well, you're going to give back $25,000 in that position. You know, mentally, that's the same amount that I put in the stock, mm -hmm. you know, so that's, that's hard to stomach. And if you're holding other stocks too, they're going to go down uh, as well. So it, it's a dance that you do. And, and there's, I don't know if there's a perfect answer, but I think there's an ebb and flow to it. And, and like Bill said, you know, I think you want to take some profits and, and others, you know, go, go for the home run, knowing that you're not always going to get it right, but you don't have to get it right all the time. If you get it right, like I said, once every, you know, a year and a half, two years, um, it could really move the needle on your whole portfolio. 
Well, what might be some of those things that can help you get it right, that help might determine whether this is a Square or a PayPal or an Apple versus something that you just want to take yeah, the money and well, run? Yeah, the quote from Bill is long, and I stopped it at the real leaders, right? And everybody always asks us, what's a leader? It's, my, it's a common question. You guys always talk about leaders on these webinars. What's a leader? And it's like, well... I guess it's a stock that goes up a lot. Step one, and it's got good earnings and sales, ideally, and it's got products and services that you're, you know, that are in super demand, and it's in the right group. And there's all these things that are, you know, kind of important. And, but you don't have to check all the boxes either, right? It's not you're not looking for a perfect stock, so to speak. So I think if if you have a lot of those boxes checked, then you want to. That's one you probably want to keep. And ideally, it helps, I think, a lot if you, it's a product and service you use. So like PayPal, I was able to hold a lot longer than normal a few years ago because, you know, this is a product that I, I used and, you know, and, and my, my mom could use it. You know, I could Venmo her money and it, it just it made it a little bit easier than, say, XYZ Semiconductor. There's a lot of semiconductor stocks and sometimes it's hard. And Arusha talked about buying the ETF because... I don't know, sometimes like, I don't know why XYZ semi is better than ABC, you know, but a lot of the tools that we have, the proprietary ratings, um, the, the acronym and cancelum will help, will help you to narrow the list down and improve your probabilities of holding that correct one. What well, about them being, sorry, Justin, household mm -hmm. names? Is, is there any element of that? Or if, a uh, monster stock is in its early stage. Are you not going to know yet if this is the next yeah. big company? It's usually if it's a household name, it's probably lo long gone in its cycle. So, you know, Google's a household name. It's not that it's a bad stock. It's just, you know, the, the, the heart's out of the melon a little bit. It's a great company, but you own the stock. So it's, it's, there's like a sweet spot, right? Where it's really starting to, to Tesla, you know, it was, a, it was a household name pretty much, but coming out of a long base. And that's where using the chart will really help. The stage of the move can help as well. So ideally it's a first stage or second stage base that you're buying the stock out of. You know, if it's an eighth stage base, uh, I, I won't pass on an eight stage base. I remember Shopify was an eight stage base about five or six, well, maybe a little bit longer, a couple of months ago, stock I'll buy, but I'm not looking for a home run. If it's coming out of an eight stage mm -hmm. base, I'm thinking 20, 25%, you know, that's, that's my max. I might even go a little bit sooner if it starts to falter. You know, one of the points I was going to make in terms of you mentioned the proprietary ratings that we have. And of course, uh, two of the big ones uh, that were kind of the start were the EPS rating and the relative strength rating. And both of those are kind of encapsulated in that L and can slim, right? The leader, uh, because if you have a leader in earnings and a leader in price performance, and the fact is those ratings are relative, right? Both of them are relative. It's comparing those stocks to all the other stocks in our database. And, you know, that was, that was one of the big things I think that Bill often would look at, but uh, certainly the earnings would a lot of times get uh, a heavier weight, especially when he was seeing those triple digit, you know, growth quarters, um, you know, quarter after quarter, it's like, look, there's something, there's something special going on there. All right. Well, that was a great discussion, guys. It's so important to have a handle on, not only the sell rules, but just to hear from other traders, what works for you. And uh, as you guys were saying, it's sort of a never ending process, but to learn from others, what works, how you should be handling some of these monster winners can make all the difference in your portfolio. So when we come back, we are going to talk about a couple of individual stocks that are looking interesting right now. We mentioned semiconductors earlier, so we're going to take a look at one of those and a couple of others. We'll be right back. Tired of reading about other people getting rich in the stock market? Today is your day. Vantage Point's artificial intelligence has predicted countless market reversals, helping traders weather any storm up to 72 hours in advance. Visit www.prestockcoaching.com and find out how their AI automatically recognizes global market patterns well ahead of the news, 
to help you pick the best trade. Go to www.freestockcoaching.com to join a free live training session today. Don't delay. Save your seat now. Trading involves financial risk and is not suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Welcome back to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Vantage Point. I have Justin Nielsen and Scott St. Clair here. We're going to go over a couple of stocks. And as we were talking about in the first segment quite a bit, there is notable strength in the semiconductor sector. And it's not really a surprise as of today's action. We've seen uh, a number of good setups in the works over the last couple of weeks. And Scott, ASML is squarely on your radar, what do you like about ASML from a technical perspective? We'll start off with that. Yeah, it's funny how I, I feel like semis have been a leading group forever. The one of the biggest winners I had in 1995 was a semiconductor stock. So it's it's such a, um, a great in, uh, group, and there's a lot of merchandise, and you you know it's it's sometimes it's hard to pick the right one because there's a lot of merchandise but they they uh if if they're going good they if they have great canceling characteristics which helps and that's that's the key with asml you know uh quarterly earnings proprietary ratings are really strong uh it came out of it wasn't quite a base because it was too short but you could see how it kind of led the market, so to speak. And that can happen sometimes where, uh, you know, the institutions are just not going to sit around and wait for the uh, market to have a really good day. If they like a name, they're going to try to accumulate it. And uh, if they can't, they, they might get anxious, you know, just like you and I and just start buying. So it's had a couple of really good blue days. You can see down below some really big volume days. It's kind of where it um, showed up on my radar. And I didn't have a lot of exposure for, uh, for the last few weeks. So um, if I wanted exposure, I like I like this name because I was like, well, if the market goes, this is probably going to go. Uh, and so I'm, I've, I'm putting on more exposure like that. Last but not least, it has great sponsorship, which is a big deal for me. I, I really prefer to have, you know, those guys and gals, uh, Fidelity Contra, is probably my favorite. I really like to see him in there. Will Danoff is the, the portfolio manager for Contra. But those other guys are really good. That's how they ended up in the index. So that's the, you know, the 20 mutual funds that make up the IBD mutual fund index. And that's the uh, sponsorship. It's you know, very important, uh, I think, to, to see at least a couple of those uh, funds in there. You know, on the technical side, the, the relative strength line, I mean, this is something that we've been talking a lot about on IBD Live, how, you know, looking at that relative strength line, it's, it's, it's really strong. But what's even more impressive, I think, is here you have a chip name, a tech name, that the, the relative strength line is comparing the stock's performance to the S&P 500. You know, if this were compared to the NASDAQ, that relative strength line would be off the chart. And, um, you know, you, you look at the daily chart and, you know, the that strong day that we saw on March 26th, um, you know, and, and the pullback, you know, and, and, and Scott pointed out perfectly, you, you, you see the volume, all of that volume down below that is tracking with that blue, you know, th those blue bars. And then the, the last two days, just, you know, very mild in terms of, yeah, sure, it was above average, but very mild compared to all of that blue volume around it. Um, and when you consider what the NASDAQ composite was doing those two days, uh, again, the relative strength line was coming in a little bit, but you know the NASDAQ was coming in harder. This was holding up fairly well compared to the NASDAQ. Uh, so yeah, I, I agree with you. There's a lot to like. Now, Scott, one, one other question though. Um, how, how much are you, you, you mentioned how with chips, sometimes it's hard to kind of know what, what is it that they do? What, what is it that's the difference here? Um, yeah. Do you do any of that fundamental kicking of the tires on ASML? I do. Um, sometimes it might be above my pay grade, but I, this is the way I like to, you know, kind of the, find the conviction. You know, a lot of times I'll buy something based on the ratings, the price action, the, the sponsorship. And if it starts to work, then I might dig in and say, you know, like we talked about earlier, maybe this could be a really big winner rather than take a, you know, 20, 25% gain if I was, you know, lucky enough to grab it. So I, I don't like to do a lot of that work initially, Justin, because 
it's gotten me into trouble before. So I've spent a couple of Sundays really, you know, on YouTube, watching the products and services, digging into the company um, transcripts on their earnings call. And then I buy it on Monday and I need to stop myself on out on Tuesday. And I just cannot pull the trigger because yeah, you, I, you invested I, too much time. That's right. <laughs> yep. I have a sunk cost fallacy, right? Yep. Yep. Um, all that time I spent on Sunday, I'm just like, I can't, I can't get out of this on a Tuesday. I, you know, so mm. I, I like to do it in reverse. If it starts to work, if I start to get ahead on of it, uh, on it, I don't know, 10, 10, 15%, something like that. Then I'm going to start to think, well, maybe do a, like what, what I talked about earlier with Bill, is this mm -hmm. one of the 50% that I'm going to sell? Or is this one of the 50% that I'm going to keep? So, yeah, I think it's very important, but um, I know other people who can develop conviction initially and then just change their mind like that, um, you know, uh, but I, I've run into, I, I remember two distinct trades where I took an outside law, outsized loss because of that. And so that's kind of changed my approach in that regard. So I feel like you've said in the past, strong convictions, weekly held, weekly something held like that. In, yes. W-E-A-K. Yes. L yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So when I, I, one thing I love about the stock market is it, when I buy a stock, man, I, I just think, yeah, this, this is it, Allie. This is the one. It's going to go to the moon. I'm going to have a 50% position size in it. I'm going to just, I'm going to Bill O'Neill this one. And then somewhere <laughs> along the way, you know, they get me, you know, so, um, but I'm always super optimistic, uh, at least initially, but I, I put a lot of weight um, in the price action. I, I have to respect the price action, even though that might shake you out. So in ASML, if you bought it at 409 and it ran to 608 right. and you're just like, this is, this is, you know, and, and these guys are, they're really knocking it out of the park as far as when you read about their business. And you might say, I'm not taking this. This is going a lot higher. Um, I'd, I just know myself, I would not be able to survive 608 to 501 in a handful of days. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also okay with the fact that maybe I get out at, at 530 and have to buy it back at 580. Um, you know, I, I'm not really worried about, you know, where, where I bought it before. If I think it's going higher, it's irrelevant what I've done with it previously. Well, and especially since that was holding the 21 day moving average line, that's the green line on this chart. Uh, for those of you that are watching the video uh, that, that's available, um, you know, if, if you if you see something trending so well like that, you know, then when it starts breaking the 21 day and then the 50 day moving average line. Yeah, I, I think I think it makes sense that you, you know, would would take some off the table, especially again, in this case where we saw that the markets were also getting a little bit overheated. So you, you kind of had both of those. Um, but yeah, I, I, and, and I just got to say, Scott, I absolutely agree with you. The, the whole idea of getting your conviction later, I think that that's a great thing that the, the market will provide feedback for you, you know, and part of that feedback is, hey, you're making good decisions. The way that the market tells you you're making good decisions, you see it right there in your account, you know, what's, what's happening with the dollars there. That's right. And to continue on our theme of holding these big winners, riding them to huge gains versus taking profits, say you have determined that ASML is one of those stocks that you want to hold for a long period, you have that conviction. We talked about all of the great qualities of this one. Is there a way that you, you find a balance to take profits on the way up, but still hold a core position? How do you, how do you do that element, yeah. Scott? I, the word you used exactly that, a core position. So what, what I'll do is, is I'll say, I'm not going to get below, say, 10% position size or 5% or 7%. So I have like a line in the sand. But I allow myself to, to take some off because, you, you know, you've heard me say it before, Ali, when the ducks are quacking, I think you want to feed them. And what that means is, you know, when, you're, when your account is stacking, you know, day, uh, two, three, four days in a row, you know, it's not, it's unsustainable. You know, it's going to come in. And my instinct is sell to avoid the come in uh, on, the, on the, my account. But I also know that 
I, I've done that before and then left a lot of money on the table, you know, going forward. So I think you want to take a, you know, take a, a, a bite of the apple, so to speak. In other words, I'm not going to eat the whole apple, but I'm going to reduce the position um, down to the uh, core. How, how appropriate the apple core, right? <laughs> <laughs> Even though the apple core is not really that good in, in the stock market sense, the a core position can really help because you can always add to it back. I find psychologically, I'm, I'm love to hear Justin's thoughts. So much easier if I own oh, yeah. stock at 400 to buy more of it at 500. Yeah. Then if I don't own it at all and did own it at 400 to start it at 500, mm. I have no problem, you know, adding to a stock. If I have a thousand shares of XYZ, I can add a hundred shares to it, even though it might not be a proper buy point. I might add just a little bit because I want to get more money into that. So by having a core position, it allows you that freedom to do that. But also a core position, you know, is a smaller position size. So you can stomach the, the, the bumps along the way because it's not making as big a move, as big a swing in, in your account value. Well, again, um, as you said, I mean, you, you, if you had a stock that, like in this case, went from 409 to 608, you know, it would, if you did no selling, then it, nat or even if you did no adding either, it would naturally become a larger weight. So, yeah. um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're not willing to take, you know, a, a, a pretty decent haircut on that, um, you know, when, when the market corrects, then that's going to be very difficult to stomach. And again, it's, as you said before, too, it's not like this would be the only one, you know, <laughs> there would be multiple stocks, you know, at the same time. So you yeah. just have to be very careful of that. Shall we move on and take a look at SWAV? So this is shockwave a stock. Medical. Yeah, Shockwave Medical. This showed up yesterday on my um, screens. They pre-announced revenue is going to be a, um, you know, triple digit, uh, surprised the street, had a big day uh, percentage wise and volume wise. Um, the volume was up, I think, 357%. Yeah. And now there is no earnings in this. And so ideally, I'd rather have, you know, earnings and sales. But this the street in the last couple of years has, you know, it's, it's been able to kind of overlook some companies losing money mm -hmm. if their revenue growth is really strong. So C Limited is a perfect example of a huge, huge winner. And yet they, you know, they, they never had any, you know, earnings. But if you look yeah, on the weekly chart, look at those, those quarterly revenue numbers from June to current, you know, they barely missed on just all triple digits. And that was a huge winner from 50 to, uh, you know, even now, it's, even though it's corrected. So revenue growth is something that the street is willing to, you know, if they see big revenue growth, ideally they say, hey, eventually that money is going to come to the, the bottom line. They, the, the, they're, this is funny, we talked about conviction, but uh, this is a stock I've owned before and I love their products. So I have to worry a little bit about this one, Justin, because of, uh, you know, I bought it yesterday and I added. I remember you put today. this on my radar. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you told me the story and I was yeah, very intrigued. Yeah. What they're doing, you know, as far as you know, treating um, here, I need to go to my notes, you know, cor coronary lithotripsy, you know, they're using acoustic waves to basically break up the plaque in, in your coronary arteries. And this type of medical process, you know, I, I, again, remember I told you I have big dreams when I buy it. I think of uh, ISRG, Intuitive Surgical, which was in the um, 2000s was, was an unbelievable, unbelievable stock. Now, when they went public, they, they went public in 2000, which was like the worst time. And then it corrected about 80% if I did the math right. But you see how it finally turned around and in 0405 went up tenfold, corrected, you know, then it went up tenfold again. Um, and, and so you've got the medical area, I think, of, was one of the, uh, besides retail and medical, I remember Scott O'Neill's giving me a sheet of um, some of the biggest winners that Bill had had, because we were going to do a webinar on this, like go over all his big, biggest winners. And and it was, yeah, 60, 70% retail medical. Yeah. So it's incredible. in that group. Um, 
the and again it's it's uh if it can get going it's not a great base is it a double bottom no nah, it's not very w ish um it's got this consolidation, but it, I, I was looking for exposure and I like that strong action. Last but not least, sponsorship. So Lord Abbott, T. Rowe Price, two of my favorites have had a position in this for a long time. So if, if, if it's a, a company that really doesn't check all the boxes that I prefer, like, you know, earn, like ASML, there better be um, some sponsorship in there um, with, with, you know, the guys like that. And we also want to hit on URA before we go, an ETF here that is forming an ascending base. Yeah. And this is a little unusual for you because you're not a usual big yeah. fan of the ETFs, right, Scott? It's, he's uh, been, yeah. he's <laughs> been uh, talking about them more and more on IBD yeah. Live. Well, a lot of people like ETFs and they're growing on me um, a little bit. Uh, they're easier to hold. You know, and, and Justin, I know you guys sometimes will choose ETFs uh, for leaderboard slash swing trader. Mm -hmm. Um I guess I'm, I'm just like old school. I want that leader, you know, I want that, which who's the leader in the uranium group, you know, <laughs> if I want exposure there. Well, but, and that, that comes from Bill too. I mean, yeah. he, he was always like, why would you buy an ETF? I, yeah. Why would I want to own an ETF when I can just buy the leader and, you know, get a much bigger gain? Why would I want to water my results down? Yes. And if, if Cameco or whatever is the leader, you know, I'm going to do worse in this one than that one, but that's okay. I can live with that because it, you know, it's kind of a, a different thought process. So this is the whole clean energy, anti-pollution. You know, I know there's a lot of controversy, obviously, with with uranium and nuclear way above my pay grade. Uh, but if the price action is good, then, you know, it reminds me a little bit of like um, the solar ETF, TAN, which went on a monster run. Mm -hmm. um, coming out coming out of a base yeah just an incredible incredible move and it held that 10 week line the whole way until it finally topped around you know where it broke there yes exactly that would be kind of your first defensive sell signal when it broke through that red line so this reminds me a little bit of that and so i've been in the ura for a while trying to hold on to it if it breaks the 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 10 week line then um then I'll just have to get out. If it goes, I think I will add if it, you know, if it goes through that pivot at 2071 in the next, uh, you know, weeks, then, then I will add to it at that point. And with both TAN and URA, I mean, what you're really talking about is kind of an, uh, an overall trend, an overall industry move, you know, that kind of lifts all the boats. And I mean, sure, there's going to be some boats that are particularly uh, faster, you know, uh, for one reason or another, but it's very hard sometimes to tell who those are going to be early on. So, you know, sometimes what I'll do is I'll start with the ETF. And then when the leader becomes a little bit more apparent, mm -hmm. I can shift some money into that. Um, or sometimes I'm just happy with the ETF. Yeah. I mean, Arusha mentioned the SMH. I know Mike Webster said that he's done that before. And when the market started a rally, he would buy the QQQs because he wasn't sure of where the leadership was. And as soon as he started to see the leadership, he just, you know, reduced the Qs and moved the money into XYZ. So uh, I don't see anything wrong with that as well. It's, there's nothing wrong with that strategy. Ideally, you'd like to be in the leader because if you get it right, you're going to make a lot more in the, in the leader. It makes sense. And Justin, you've talked a lot about having that strategy with the market exposure to ETFs when you're not seeing setups when the market is turning as well. Or, you know, sometimes it's I am seeing setups, but they're going on swing trader and I'm you know, missing <laughs> or that, you know, or, you know, we're restricted or, you know, for whatever reason. And so, um, so, yeah, I mean, sometimes if you if you can get the the industries that are moving right, you know, you can you can you can do very well with ETFs and uh, I, I do tend to be a little bit more aggressive sometimes and get into some of the triple leveraged, you know, you, you got the chips, you know, sure you can do SMH, but you could also do SOXL, you know, if you want the triple leverage. So there's so many options out there now with the ETFs, um, you know, different ways to play those, uh, you know, so again, when I can't get into an individual stock for restrictions, um, you know, then that's just an alternative. Um, but again, I just want to, you know, be clear that certainly the, 
the better way to go is get the leader, you know, but sometimes that's not always easy. And this is, um, you know, something that does allow you to, to diversify to a certain degree. Now, when you're in a sector ETF, that's not diversification. You're diversified <laughs> within that group, yeah. but, you know, don't think you can buy, you know, uh, you know, a lot of a certain ETF and say, oh, I'm diversified because it's across, you know, however many companies, you know, you're, if that group gets hit, you know, you're going to take an outsized loss to your portfolio um, if, if something bad happens to the group. So, uh, you know, be, be careful of how you use that term diversification. <laughs> Right. And really quickly here, bringing it back to URA, as we wrap up here, Scott, you mentioned adding to an existing position if it does clear this 2071 area, would you initiate a new position there or those who are listening or watching, what should they be thinking about uh, in terms of initiating a position with this URA? Yeah, I'd I could do that. I guess it'll depend on how, if how much progress I'm making, you, you know, at that point, I like to, if I'm doing well in the year, I want to press, I want to risk the, 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 the money that the market has given me. Um, and house you know, money at that point. Yeah. You know, like I want to be a pig, like George Soros would say. Uh, so I'm going to, if I'm doing really well, I'll be aggressive. I'll, I'll increase, it'll be a, a brand, I'll think it's, I'll pretend it's a new position, you know, from a, a strategy standpoint. So it's XYZ pharmaceuticals and it's a brand new position. If I'm, you know, if I'm getting chopped to death, like I have been for the last couple of, of weeks, um, you know, and I'm not that far ahead, then then I might be reluctant to, to increase it. So the answer is, Ali, I don't have a perfect answer, <laughs> but was there uh, but, ever a perfect answer? No, but that's, that's how I think about it. I, 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 yeah. I would, um, it would depend a lot on how well I, I was doing overall. Well, and that's usually when people ask me any questions on portfolio management type things, I always say it depends, you know, where yeah. did you buy it? Where did you, you know, what, what's going on in the market? There's as you said, there's so many factors that go into those decisions. Um, that's, that's where you just have to kind of get better with experience uh, is, you know, kind of know what your personal pitfalls are and, you know, kind of get a sense of, you know, where you're at in the cycle. What, what inning of the game are you in? Mm -hmm. Great points made by you both. Thanks so much, guys, for a lively discussion. That's it for this episode of Investing with IBD. And next week, we're going to have Jordan Kahn, the Chief Investment Officer of ACM Funds. And he's also a longtime CanSlim style trader. So that's coming up next week. Make sure to tune in for that. But thanks so much for listening to this episode. We'll see you next week. And for this week's notes and charts, make sure to go to investors.com slash podcast, where you'll find details for each episode in the podcast episode section. And make sure to subscribe, rate and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you wanna watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.